Ladies and gentlemen, Parag Khanna is our guest tonight. Um, he's a couple of years younger than my eldest son, and I just can't believe what you've put into life already. <laughs> um, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dean. But I want to start with one question because I'm confused. Well, I'm not confused because I read this book over the weekend, which as a non-reader who can't read properly, I tell you, is fantastic and quite easy to read. I was dreading it. I thought, it's going to be clever and intelligent, and I'm going to be in trouble. Um, but very well written. Uh, but I've read that you were born in India in 1977. Correct. I've also read that your parents went to the UAE correct. in 1970. Sort of correct. Sort of correct. So did mum go home so you were born in India, or...? Yes, but actually they were in Sudan, in, right. uh, in East Africa. My brother was born in 1972 in Khartoum. The whole set of countries that were, you know, leafy, not yet overpopulated, bucolic, post-colonial countries uh, with still some semblance of the virtues inherited from the British Empire, uh, all of which have since been extinguished in terms of those positive legacies, but it was in that what, what period. What would you call the virtues of the British Empire? Uh, you know, good administrative civil, civil service, obviously, you know, sort of the functioning bureaucracy, the, the, the quality infrastructure that remains in terms of the urban planning, obviously the, 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 the benefiting from the trade networks that continue to exist and thrive. And, and of course, remember that in the 19th century, uh, you know, the British Empire circulated so many Indians to uh, East African countries. And so there was still this sort of, um, you know, uh, continuity in Indian Ocean trading networks, but, you know, I think as countries became more insular, uh, you know, they actually increased, their populations grew, but their capacity decreased. A lot of things atrophied, basically, in these countries, and that's obviously what you're seeing uh, today in many ways. But at the time, there was a, a headiness to it for, for an Indian family. Think about it, it's all about, migration is all about relative circumstances, right? It's wh where you're coming from. So when the, when the oil rush began in the 70s, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, qualified, educated Indians, uh, like my parents, my mother is actually a, a, one of the first sort of computer scientists coming out of India, one of the first females to graduate from IIT. My dad had a you know, very good business education. So to get an opportunity to move to Abu Dhabi, uh, so, so from India to, to Khartoum, then to Abu Dhabi, uh, working for Tata Exports, and Tata today is obviously one of India's biggest brands. It was obviously still India's largest company back then, or very much already, but with a much lower sort of, you know, value of goods that were, you know, tractors and rotary dial telephones and things like this. But it was a huge opportunity. Um, so that's why I w was, by coincidence, born in India, but already living in the, in the UAE, basically. Uh, so I, I spent my childhood there. Right. Well, you've, you've gone on to become a senior uh, geopolitical advisor to the U.S. government, uh, special forces operation in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, but how did you feel when Jeremy Hunt quoted your book recently? Well, it was a, it was a positive surprise. Uh, I mean, the backstory is that, uh, you know, as, as you well know, or, or maybe don't follow as much, there are many dimensions to Brexit, and I feel like the ones that are covered are, are not trivial or superficial, but are certainly the inside parliamentary kinds of gamesmanship episodes that are going on. But there is the entire international dimension of maintaining or rebuilding your commercial relations with the rest of the world. And so Jeremy Hunt was uh, early this year, very early in the year, um, traveling in Malaysia and, and Singapore. So we had a dinner and uh, he gave a speech at the IISS, which is of course one of the august British uh, strategic think tanks and they have an outpost in Singapore. So, uh, so you know, I, I had a chance to have a very small group dinner with him, conversation with him, and, uh, and he gave that lecture and quoted some of the statistics in the book about- Did you know he was going to quote it? No, no, I had no, no idea. Right. No, absolutely not. Uh, in fact, uh, at the time that he quoted the book, he didn't physically have the book, at least not from me. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, I met him after he had actually uh, quoted me. Um, but, but was it published or had he got an advance on it somewhere? Uh, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I mean, someone in the FCO had advance, uh, yeah. advance copy. Um, yeah. But you know, the, uh, again, you know, Singapore is one of those places with which, of course, Britain has very strong ties. Uh, it's too bad its economy is not the size of China because then you wouldn't have to worry so much about how, how Britain will uh, rebuild its global trade linkages uh, after Brexit, uh, but sadly, Singapore is not quite that big. It's a wonderful entrepot, um, and it's a place, obviously, where just about all things British are still very welcome. Uh, you know, 
Do you think we are going to have a serious problem after Brexit? Well, look, let's, let's not generalize about these things, because I think whether we're talking about populist politics in America and, you know, is immigration good or bad, you know, people just give these heartfelt answers. As you can probably tell by the thickness of some of the books I write, I'm not interested in opinions. I, I'm only interested in, in data and, and analyzing it and trying to have as accurate data as possible. So in answering that question, I don't want to be just another layer of opinion in a, in a frothy but forgettable conversation. I want to give you some, some brute facts. And the fact is that when you go out and negotiate, you know, for these uh, so-called free trade agreements that everyone would love to have with you because there's still plenty of countries that love free trade, um, that's only the 1%. That's only sort of you've just shown up. But not showing up isn't 99%. Showing up is 1% in trade negotiations. The other 99% is the hard work of, uh, of uh, um, the, the sort of tug of war over each and every term and condition. And there, I'm going to be again be, be awfully blunt, but you're getting hammered. I mean, you're getting you're getting mercilessly hammered. You have the uh, Americans telling you you're going to have to eat that chlorinated chicken. Uh, you've got the um, you know Japanese saying you know well you'll just have to wait in line because we've had to we've just done this big agreement with the EU and you're no longer the point of entry for the EU and Honda is not going to even manufacture cars here anymore. You have the Chinese saying oh you just sailed a warship in a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea so let's just just postpone those negotiations. And again, this is what happens when, and you, you know, you, you're, you're, as a society, you haven't sunk as low as the US has, right? But you're a much smaller country, so you're much more vulnerable uh, to, these, to this kind of whiplash. But you will really have to wait in line. And even the, even the United States has been told by Japan, you know, we're really busy with the Trans-Pacific Partnership right now. It would have been better if you had joined that agreement, which you, by the way, America created and then opted not to join. So it's just not a priority for us to have a bilateral free trade agreement with you. Um, you know, how about you instead just come back and, um, you know, join the TPP? Now, this is, again, all of these, these are rude awakenings. They're rude awakenings for America. They're rude awakenings for Britain. And even when you are, in the case of America, the senior partner in a geopolitical alliance with Japan, which Americans still think of as a country that owes it everything and it still protects, you have them giving you this kind of uh, pushback. So if that happens to America, just imagine what's happening to you. And I was told yesterday I did a lunch for a whole bunch of lords, peers of the, the House of Lords, and, uh, and one of them said, you know, but if you look at the history of EU trade negotiations, um, you know, they actually do sometimes grab a lot of, uh, you know, go for a lot of quick wins and a lot of free trade negotiations have, have been with smaller countries and markets that go much faster than the big ones, so maybe we'll get in there quick. And I said, yes, that's because those countries are all small and vulnerable and make very significant, almost existential economic compromises. And haven't just wrecked their party. <laughs> and, and I say to my, and, I, and I, so I said to him, I was like, is that the way you want to be perceived as a small and, you know, third tier country that will make any compromise before the EU to have, a, have an agreement? Because that's obviously not the position that you in any case are formally yeah. representing. I don't know what you've heard from Brussels today. It probably hasn't been what, what, uh, Brexiteers wanted. So again, fact-based answers here around where you stand. Theresa May went to India, did not exactly get some kind of grand, all-encompassing, um, you know, free trade agreement, in in including services. Now, I applaud the agenda of a high-value services-driven economy such as Britain is in wanting to innovate a new kind of trade agreement that involves services better than existing trade agreements do. However, that's where you need armies of lawyers, right, in order to actually get it done. And all of the trade lawyers on earth have been negotiating exactly those things in Geneva for the last 15 years. And I have some news for you. They've gotten absolutely nowhere. And on short notice, understaffed, without a template or a code book for exactly what you want from every individual country in the world, it's just not going to happen overnight. So again, I'm just stating the facts. I, mean, I, I wasn't going to get into Brexit. <laughs> I want to talk about your book. Really? But, but yeah, but, but I'm fascinated by that. David Davis argues that Canada plus, 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 plus works and would work quickly because everything has already been negotiated and agreed with somebody. You just have to tip X out whoever and put in United Kingdom. Do you think that's true? It, it's self-evidently not true. Right. <laughs> what, what more I have to say than that? Again, every country has its own set of peculiarities and preferences. We have moved away from a world of universal, all-encompassing, 
trade liberalization yeah. agendas towards bilateral ones where countries feel much more empowered to protect their domestic sectors or interests and exclude those. And they may very well be excluding the very things that you want them to open up in. So there is no notion that, well, what worked for Canada and Britain is therefore going to work for Britain and some other set of countries. That's just not the way anyone is negotiating right now. Most economists, almost every economist in the world, certainly trade purists, as, as you might call them, would want that to be true. Don't get me wrong. Right? As I said, I support your, the agenda, in a way, to pioneer a new category uh, uh, of trade that covers, the, again, things that really matter and are, and are of great value, like your digital and financial and other kinds of services, rather than just thinking that the world economy is a bunch of widgets put on tankers and sailed around. That's not the way the world really is anymore. But you're not going to get there overnight. It's not going to happen. Okay, we'll leave Brexit. <laughs> we'll, we'll park Brexit. Um, I, this is a quote directly from the book. I didn't write it. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> I just haven't heard it, so I want to disown it before yeah. I... <laughs> I think you'll like this one. <laughs> okay. To describe something as Asian can often have opposite connotations. Elegant or unsophisticated, precise or chaotic, risk-averse or bold. Not only do outsiders have divergent understandings of Asian, but so do Asians. Um, do you want to expand on that a bit? Sure. I mean... You know, this part of the motivation of writing the book was simply to point out the ob two obvious facts to people. Um, the first is there are five billion people in in Asia, right? Not just the 1.5 billion who are in China, and that alone, I think, is a great public service. I'll give, give myself credit for because for 20 years we've had books about Asia, purportedly about Asia, that are basically 99% about China with a couple of pages devoted to the other three and a half billion people. But the further you look into the future, the more you see that Asia, Asians, the other three and a half billion, are also claiming their rightful place. They may not be at the center of the universe where China wants to be. But the second fact is that Asia's history, uh, you know, 4,000 years of, of um, interactions among themselves, has is almost always been multipolar. China has never dominated all of Asia, ever, literally never. Right? It's had its tributary system, which they like to hearken back to. Look at a map. Google China tributary system largest expanse, if you want to, right? and see what you get. It's not all of Asia. It's a sliver of the geographic Asia. It's certainly um, you know, nothing like the five billion people. It never has and it never will. The only Asian power to have really dominated the full geography was the Mongols. That was a really, really long time ago. And it's not going to happen again. A lot of things have intervened. Uh, a lot of things have happened in the intervening years, like uh, nuclear deterrence, let's say, sovereignty, uh, a few other forces that militate against the idea that everything is just China. So yes, you can have you know, contradictory understandings of Asia on that simple geographic and territorial thing. And then also the aesthetic things that, that you mentioned about sort of, you know, how do we understand Asia? Because there is, Japan is Asia. You know, we, we, we still like to talk about Japan you, you as the Western kind of outpost, like Australia, you know, as if Japanese and Australians, they're not, they're not Asian, well, they're like us. you me by including you know. Australia. I'm not sure a lot of my guess, Australian I mean, mates would think of themselves as Asian. Well, so but you could have quoted that too. I have this, you know, a very explicitly worded paragraph where I say, you know, the word, the, the, the adjective Asian is a geographic descriptor, right? I'm not saying, and, and I say, actually, I, I thought you would have wanted to quote this. I say Australians are white Asians. Russians are white Asians. Get, get, get you, I mean, I'm not saying that other people will use the nomenclature that I am, but I am saying they should because I'm actually just using standard, literal terminology, right? Uh, you know, so it's not an ethnic, it cannot be an ethnic descriptor because there's no such thing as an ethnic Asian. You can be an ethnic Indian like me, you can be ethnically Chinese or Japanese, but Asian is a geography, right? So there's nothing wrong with including Australia. So imagine, I mean, I have not had any pushback from Australia yet. I have said, you are the white Asians. And that was on the cover of the Australian Financial Review as an excerpt of this book. And instead, what I'm hearing more and more is, yeah, let's accept it. That's what I'm hearing. So of course, yeah, yes, yeah. we all have Australian friends. We all have Russian friends who might say, my goodness, this guy's written a chapter of his book about the Asianization of Russia. Well, we're not Asian. We aspire to be European, and we've, we own half of London. Ha ha. You know, so yes. But as I point out in the book, the, the ethnographic mix of Russia it does not look like its hockey team, right, which is all sort of you know, white Slavic guys. 
Um, it's a very diverse country. The fastest growing populations in Russia are in fact um, the, the Muslim Turkic uh, populations, for example. So all of our countries are more diverse than we think. And, and in the book, you quote Kevin Rudd, um, a former uh, Australian prime minister who went on to be um, foreign secretary, didn't It's about he? eight prime yeah. ministers you, you, you ago. You quote him as trying, <laughs> trying to create a grouping <laughs> akin to Europe. With the, so he meant it, not, not, certainly not facetiously, he meant it aspirationally, but he's far too serious and knowledgeable a, a scholar, diplomat, and statesman to, uh, you know, to, to not be aware that it's uh, never really going to happen in that way. And, and this is a critical thing, actually, because I, I like him a great deal, but uh, he didn't mean, he used the phrase Asian Union, but of course he knows that Asia is far too diverse. There will never be an Asian Union like a European Union, right? And this is one of the points I try to make. All of the Eurocentric analogies from which we derive all of our theories of international relations, and all of the analogies we like to use to uh, project the future of the world about can, you know, who will be number one, who is the hegemon, and this kind of thing, all of that is rubbish when you look in the Asian context, right? Again, you're talking about six or seven mutually unintelligible civilizations with anywhere from hundreds of millions to over a billion people, none of whom have ever and will ever bow before each other, who will never have a common currency, central bank, or army, or supranational parliament. None of those things will actually happen in Asia. But that's not the yardstick of Asian convergence or integration. Asians have their own metrics of these things. For Asians, it's good enough to trade more with each other than they do with you. Because remember, not 30 years ago, they depended way more on trade with us than with each other. Today, that's flipped on its head. They trade way more with each other than they do with us. Right? And that, for them, is really, a, if for anyone, by any measure, an astounding degree of progress. You, you say in the book that Europe is, a more pow is more powerful as a system than merely a region. Right. But that in Asia, you don't think that's going to be true at all. Should I have campaigned against Brexit on that? <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, you know, so again, no, no, no. I believe that Asia is becoming greater than the sum of its parts, right? And that, that is all it takes to be, you know, um, you know, something that's meaningful as a system. So again, Asia today is greater than the sum of its parts. For, for 500 years, Asia was less than the sum of its parts, right? From, from the day the... Portuguese and, and, and Dutch and Spanish began to establish their colonies in Europe in, the 16, in Asia in the 16th century, Asia went from the Silk Roads era, where they had everything to do with each other and nothing to do with anyone else, to being fragmented, divided, colonized, and then came the Cold War. So again, the point of departure of the book is, right, is saying for 500 years of colonialism, the Cold War, Asia fit, dissipated, fractured, right? It belonged to us in many ways. The U.S. took the Philippines, right, in the late 19th century. The last, uh, the last outpost of European colonialism in, in Asia was Macau, right, only handed back to um, China about 20 years ago, right? So, uh, um, you know, you have this uh, period of fragmentation, and, and no, one, no one alive today, obviously, can remember the era of the Silk Roads. We can read books about it. We can hearken back to it, but we, have, we cannot fathom what it was. But today it's being rebuilt uh, over the past uh, 30 years. And, and again, I think that clearly already based on just the complementarities of trade and the diplomatic institutions and the financial vectors and the infrastructure investment, Asia is becoming astoundingly more than the sum of its parts already. But that doesn't mean it will speak with one voice. Europe is helped in areas, obviously, of trade negotiations and, and in terms of regulatory convergence that attracts investment in other areas by speaking with one voice. I've always felt that, you know, and this is not to sympathize with Brexit, but I've always felt that, you know, there is a dynamism that comes from competition of ideas and models within a given region. So America, for example, is a high, highly federalized system. It doesn't have a national educational system. And so you can see that there are smart states like Massachusetts that have done you know, pioneering reforms in, in healthcare and education, um, you know, affordable and, and highly effective. And then there are states that are laggards, but the laggards can learn you know, from those that are better. And within Europe, you actually have a similar set of dynamics. So I, I don't believe in a total homogeneity of Europe to which you must necessarily you know, sort of converge and bow down and prostrate yourselves, right? So Britain is right to want to retain certain independence. And the, even many of the countries still in the EU obviously practice many of their own sorts of things. They haven't been homogenized and had their identities stamped out either. 
Of course, that's never going to happen in Asia, but the complementarities serve their collective purposes for sure. You, you talk in the book um, a great length, as, as you've just summarized, about the age and century beginning when Asia crystallizes, is the right. word you use. Yeah. And you say crystallization began in May 2017, 68 countries, two thirds of the world's population, half the world's GDP met in Beijing for the first Belt and Road Summit Initiative and launched the largest coordinated infrastructure investment plan in human history. Can you develop for us, please, Parag, what the Belt and Road Initiative is actually all about? Sure. So a couple of things about that. I remember I went and sort of took you back for a brief flash to the 16th century. You know, historians talk about the pre-colonial world of the Indian Ocean and the vibrant trading networks as Afro-Eurasia. And what's great about that term that historians use is it contains Africa, Europe, and Asia. Afro-Eurasia. And indeed, you know, the, the lion, almost all, the entire world economy was uh, derived from those Silk Road relations terrestrially and the Indian Ocean trade among the dynasties of, um, of, uh, of Southeast Asia, India, and so forth. And the Belt and Road Initiative, fast forward to 2017, is, is trying to coordinate the resurrection of, those, uh, of that Afro-Eurasia. Now, in many ways, it's already happened. The lion's share of growth in world trade, growth in trade, not total trade, is between the, in, in the Afro-Eurasian space. And I have a very simple map of this in the book. I show you Europe, I show you uh, Asia, I show you the United States, and you can see the volumes of trade just between those vectors. And if you were to bring in Africa, you would see the Europe, Africa, Asia triangle. And you would see that, in fact, the entire Western Hemisphere, even the United States included in that, which is one of the, obviously one of the largest economies in the world, is not the dominant force in global trade. I wish Donald Trump had seen that map before he launched this trade war. Because America is actually autarkic. America is self-sufficient. You know, um, North America as a whole, as a continent, has pretty much all the fuel, of course, of the shale energy revolution, all the food, all the people. North America has, you know, 500 million people. Uh, industrial power, technology, knowledge, talent. North America barely needs the rest of the world. But you do. And Asians do, and Africans do. And you have each other. And this resurrection of Afro-Eurasia is where, again, it's been happening for 30 years, since the day the Soviet Union collapsed, is when China began to cross its borders and start to build infrastructure and pipelines all the way to the Caspian Sea and beyond. My first book, uh, t you know, I started writing it 15 years ago, was basically my backpacking through Central Asia and looking at these Chinese infrastructure projects. It didn't have a name then. There was no Belt and Road. The, the term Belt and Road has captured our imagination. and We've sort of, you know, riified it. And I obviously have not helped by, by putting it on page one of this book. However, it, it is to say that that's been happening as a natural process. There was no question that as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, Afro-Eurasia would be reborn. In retrospect, it is so obvious. And now we have the evidence. And now, 30 years into the process, China said, you know what? Let's get this stuff more coordinated, more organized, and let's put a trillion dollars of money behind it, our money. And now everyone else is putting their money too. So the critical thing is, and, and this wasn't part of your question, but I know that it comes up all the time, is the geopolitical implications. Because for many people, um, you know, it was born with China. Again, false, it wasn't. Um, and China dominates it, true. But China will therefore dominate it forever and, and use uh, debt trap diplomacy to ensnare every country into a subordinate relationship of you know, hierarchy and colonialism, neo-colonialism with China. False, that's not what's going to happen. Because now everyone's gotten in on the bandwagon, everyone's putting in their own money, everyone's competing with China to get projects, right? Um, the Italians have announced today that they're gonna join the Belt and Road, the first important European country uh, to do so. Um, it, not because they want to be, again, sub subservient uh, to China, but because they actually want to be inside that tent where decisions are being made so their companies can get the projects, right, the infrastructure projects. And the, United, the UK, and this is one of the things that the Jeremy Hunt and I spoke at length about, <coughs> and I talk about it here as well, um, is the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance. You actually, may or may not know this, you actually have a standing policy relationship with China. It is called the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance. Its sole purpose is to recycle Chinese money that's going into these countries, whether it's Pakistan or Indonesia or Sri Lanka or, or, or East Africa, um, and have that money spent on British business. 
right? Which is a very smart thing to do. It's not sneaky or subversive. This is brilliant. You just have to, have to actually do it, right? And so it's your own version of what Italy is going to do. And I advocate very strongly that all Western countries join China's initiative so that you can dilute China inside its own tent and snatch the business that they've been dominating. Because that's actually the way these cycles, these cycles work. I can explain it at greater length, but for now. You, you talk in the book about China uh, having a history of not colonizing. Um, do you think when they began this investment program, they thought they were quietly colonizing? not expecting everybody else to join them? So yes and no. Uh, uh, you know, take the latter part first. It has succeeded beyond its wildest imagination as a branding exercise, and they probably regret ever having named anything Belt and Road Initiative. If they had a colonial mindset, they should have just sneakily carried on and kept on doing it and not called it you know, the equivalent of the British East India Company, because that's now how we think of it uh, as being. Again, it's not going to play out the same way, because colonialism is dead, fortunately. Now, did they sneakily want to colonize the world? I'll give you, give you a very matter-of-fact answer, and the answer is no. Now, I know that we all hate China because you're not allowed in the room anymore in the Western world unless you hate China, but I want to state some facts uh, for the record as someone who does understand the country as well as uh, you know, non-sinologist can. I do go there very often and have traveled, driven across the country and written now my sixth book that deals heavily with China. I don't need to, I'm not the first one to tell you that they've never been an imperial external colonizer. They seek to subdue the barbarians, let's use their own diplomatic language uh, for this, and to keep them at bay, right? But the notion that they will, uh, you know, sort of have this mission civilatrice over the rest of the world is not really part of their, uh, of their cultural mentality. Uh, that, I don't think that's really something that anyone debates, quite frankly, right? So let's just put that to one side, or let's build on that. Secondly, Belt and Road, and a lot, and, and you know, with their relationships stretching as far as, uh, as you know, uh, uh, Chile and uh, Angola and Nigeria and so forth, this is purely driven by supply chains, right? It's not saying, oh my goodness, we have grown so bloody fast in the last 40 years, and it is 40 years to the day, right, basically, that uh, Shenzhen became the first special economic zone, Deng Xiaoping's reforms were undertaken. Um, the country suddenly became the world's factory floor, um, you know, built up these massive trade surpluses, and now is the world's largest economy. It, it's pretty much a blink of an eye. So they caught themselves off guard, and they said, and, and they realized, oh my goodness, we're going to need to import a, a lot of resources from everywhere. And of course, they are the largest commodities importer in the world. So now they're out there almost defensively saying, we got to buy all this stuff. We also need to protect it. So first of all, we need to build lots of infrastructure because all of these countries from which are getting our oil and gas and minerals and stuff are pretty much shit because they are former British and former French, French colonies that have not done anything for their infrastructure in 70 years, right? So I'm one of these Indians who doesn't necessarily think colonialism was all that bad, <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and, and quite frankly, what smart countries do is they accept history, they, take the, they make the most of the experience, and they build on what was good, and they move on. Like Singapore, the little place where I, I've lived for the last uh, few years. The, Singapore is a country that's made the most of the colonial experience and improved upon it. The infrastructure is better, the government's better, right? Um, just about everything is better than the way you left it, and you left it pretty well. Um, you know, or, or better than it was a century before, let's say, you know, Hong Kong, uh, same thing. Now, there, those places, though, most of the world, most of the commodities exporting countries, again, the African countries, have hardly improved themselves while their populations have tripled and their infrastructure has fallen into decay. So China said, well, if we're going to be, you know, buying all of your oil and gas and cobalt and aluminum and iron ore and so on, you know, you should really have better ports and railways, don't you think? And so these countries said, yeah, except we have no money, right? We've been heavily indebted poor countries. There's an official term for that. It's HIPIC, H-I-P-C. It's a World Bank acronym. We've been heavily indebted poor countries with absolutely no, no one. We're abandoned by capital markets. No one lends to us. Where we borrow, it's at 20% or whatever, usurious uh, interest rates. So China comes along and says, fine, we're going to build it for you. Bring in some Chinese workers, we'll do it a lot faster. And these countries have massively profited from this. Yes, their debt levels have gone up and so forth. Then there's the security bit. Okay, it's like, well now, here we are, China, importing all the world's raw materials, and it all flows through the Strait of Malacca, which we don't control, 
and the U.S. could cut this off at any point in time. So we definitely need to have, you know, better warships, submarines, maybe some private military companies protecting this and that oil and gas field. So China's at the moment still technically doing the bare minimum, I would say, to protect their physical supply chains. It's actually the bare minimum. I mean, if, if the shoe were on the other foot, right, uh, yeah. we'd be saying, let's go in there, great guns, we better colonize that place, we can't trust that. Com that, that country, let's, you know, let, we better teach them democracy or whatever. This is, you know, classic American 19th century speak because this is, this is what, what America did. So they honestly don't have a colonial mindset. What they're doing is largely defensive. It has certainly offensive sort of tones to it, but you really don't see Chinese out there firing their guns off, right? Because the difference between uh, China today and Britain then or America in the 20th century um, is again sovereignty and the right to say no. And what China is hyper cautious about is the fact that if they, uh, you know, deliver a, a beatdown, uh, you know, to any small, frail, weak country that has crossed them financially or otherwise, the whole world is going to gang up on them. Everyone, everyone on the planet Earth is watching China for every little misstep. Right? Again, you, know, we, you got to do colonialism before there was democracy, sovereignty, transparency, civil society, scrutiny, and all of these things. You got away with it for centuries. In the, in, in America got away with it because it was the dirty tricks of the Cold War, right? And, uh, you know, sort of divide and conquer authoritarianism, you know, sort of alliance politics was the order of the day. China has no such luck, right? You know, in, in, uh, if you go to Islamabad today at the airport, they have a counter. It says, you know, welcome to our Chinese friends, right? It's basically in the, they register their cell phones and so forth. This is not because they're going to get VIP treatment, right? It's to track them, to monitor them. Everywhere every Chinese person goes, they are being watched. And one Chinese person does one thing wrong, nowhere in that country, whether it's Zambia or Nigeria or Angola, is afraid to put a bullet in their head, right? You had the bullets back then. America had the bullets in its day. China is afraid to use a single bullet. Very different circumstances. Very, very different. You talk about building democracy. Humphrey and I were talking about this with a bridge or something when we were discussing. Humphrey's which... written a great book, Democracy Kills. Yeah. <laughs> One we, of we, your classics. We were talking about it. But <coughs> you, you can't build democracy. We, we established and agreed that. But um, going back, would it be paranoia in this country thinking that China will behave as we might have behaved in centuries past, when, for example, we look at them investing in our nuclear fuel program. Right. Do you think we're paranoid, worrying that they will turn it off one day or turn it into a bomb? Or It depends. I mean, look, there's no doubt that there is this broader technological undercurrent of the ability of many countries, not just China, to infiltrate and weaponize, you know, infrastructure, yeah. whether it's critical infrastructure like electricity grids, power plants, nuclear Huey installations, it could be, <coughs> you know, could be, you know, mobile phones, um, and you do want to guard against that. But again, you have the right to say no. Dozens of countries in the world have re-regulated their investment, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, laws so that um, China can no no foreign investor can own more than forty nine percent. Um, you know, uh, of, of a critical infrastructure. Australia's done it, you know, Kazakhstan's doing it, even Canada's done it. When Canada, when CNOC, the Canadian oil company, bought Nexen, uh, the North American energy company uh, headquartered in Canada, the Canadian regulator said, okay, we're going to let this happen. This will be the first and the last, right? Because there is this sense of discomfort about it. And that's not even one of those assets that you digitally manipulate yeah. in order to conduct a cyber attack on, on a country. So again, it's up to you. With Huawei, um, you know, I, I'm on the fence about this because they operate both largely as a, as a you know, as a commercial business providing a, a, a high value, low cost technology of, of, of commendable quality, most people would say. Um, but there are those back doors and you never know what's going to happen with, with your data. Uh, most countries actually don't seem to really care uh, because their data has already been taken by the U.S. National Security Agency anyway. Uh, <clears throat> in other cases, you can cut some kind of a hybrid deal. You can you know, find ways to locate servers on shore or whatever. In other cases, you want to resist Huawei because it's actually a commercial opportunity to block them for a few years until Western com companies like Ericsson and, and Nokia get their act together. I mean, this is a gift to Ericsson and Nokia, the anti-Huawei backlash. If they don't use these, th this, this uh, backlash or blockage of Huawei 
to turn themselves into tech juggernauts again, shame on them, right? Because they've just been given this uh, new lease on life for the next uh, couple of years to build up. So there'll be a there'll be a 5G marketplace, you know, and there'll be interoperability. But you know, we already have the internet, and clearly it's a highly vulnerable network. So we're going to have more and more of that. Yes, I mean, again, just because China can shut down your electricity grid or someone can, you know, do it through an electromagnetic pulse or whatever, you know, the fact is that that's the world we live in, and it's not. China didn't build that world, right? China is going to exploit it. North Koreans already exploit it. Now, you've all been hacked by North Korea already at some point, right? <laughs> we all have. Um, Iranians are, Americans are. So that, that's the new world. I don't blame China for us being in that circumstance. And again, remember that China doesn't just think about what it could punitively do through an action. It thinks about what the reaction to its action will be. Quite frankly, when I look at U.S. foreign policy, you know, we should be taking much more into account what the reaction to our actions would be. We might come out with different decisions. In the case of China, the evidence suggests that they uh, are therefore much more cautious about their actions. And I'll give you a very, again, concrete example, and it's not an insignificant one. It's, it's, it's dead central. It's the Doklam Plateau standoff between India and China from the summer of 2017. Um, there's no doubt that the Chinese PLA could have quashed the Indian army at the border in the summer of 2017. And go and go YouTube this instance. It was quite a heated uh, standoff. But guess who backed down? China did. Why would they do that? Because they're not just thinking about how they could, they could you know, <clears throat> humiliate India. They're thinking about the fact that they have 13 other neighbors. And what happens to all of your investments in your Belt and Road projects? What is the price you pay for humiliating India in a, in a random middle of nowhere Himalayan uh, border? The price is severe, right? Now, when we look at China, we don't think about how they think. But isn't it so obvious when I've just told you that that's how they're thinking? Wouldn't you, if you were in Beijing, think the same thing? If I do this, what about all of that, right? So there is actually some inbuilt, inbuilt prudence to some of what they do. Now, they've missed, they've overstepped a great deal in so many ways. You know, all of this island reclamation, the South China Sea, they probably should have done it you know, it take, it's taken longer to do it, right? Um, you know, the, the, the brinksmanship with Taiwan, you don't have to do it. There are these domestic factors, nationalism, the Xi Jinping's authoritarianism, and on and on and on, that play a, a, a negative role. So they're not the most brilliant minds. And I, I, again, the whole point of this book is to say China is also winging it. They're, they're all, they're, they don't have a thousand year plan to take over the world that they will stop at nothing to achieve. And even if they did, they're not going to achieve it. You know, and, and I give you a thousand reasons why. Um, it, and, and so, you know, it's, it's, they, 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 even if they have a vision, they are as fumbling, bumbling, uh, fly by the seat of your pants uh, in many, many ways as we are, actually. So you're saying you trust, <coughs> you trust the Chinese? No. I don't, I don't you, trust you don't trust the Chinese? No one, no one <laughs> trusts the Chinese. And, and, and Would you trust them more or less than the Russians? It depends on the, the context. Uh, no one should trust anyone. That's how diplomacy works. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a student of diplomacy. I've studied it my whole life. What would Henry Kissinger uh, have said to that? He would give you the identical answer. <laughs> I, know. I mean, uh, uh, the, there, there is no other answer for any student of diplomacy to give. I mean, the, the diplomacy it exists on the basis of it, it's sending out emissaries to smooth out the inherent But don't you have to trust exists. so far? You only trust where needed. Where you needed. trust but verify, as Reagan yeah. was, would have trust said. Trust and verify. Do we have any questions at this stage before we, we move on or save them for the end? Yes, gentlemen there. So this great Asian system taking shape, uh, as you put it in the book, um, and you encourage us to think of Asia homogeneously but recognizing all the heterogeneous aspects of it because th there are great differences. What should the response of um, quote-unquote the West be to it? Right. And how do you rate the response so far if they even recognize, if we slash they even recognize it? You know, there is a teleological inevitability to the rise of Asia. This multi-decade period where industrial technology is married with a um, you know, young uh, uh, labor force, 
and global markets, right? Whether it is Europe during the Industrial Revolution, America in the 20th century, and Asia today. There is an absolute, utter inevitability to it. Trying to stop the rise of Asia, I mean, first of all, it's already happened. So, I mean, I could have called this book The Present is Asian. It's just not a catchy title, uh, but it's true. Um, so there's nothing you can do about it. So, so therefore, I think you're asking the right question, which is, so how do you make the most of it is really the, the only meaningful, useful question to be asking. And there, there is very little common Western response. And this is where I point to the great divergence in the Atlantic Alliance, because Europe is looking at Asia and seeing, in, as with, with Italy and with uh, Germany and its export uh, focus on Asia, um, is saying, let's ride this wave. Let's make money off of it. You know, Europe trades, yourselves still included in this figure, $1.6 trillion a year with Asia, and, less, and only less than half of that is with China. About half of it is with China. That's pretty amazing. You only trade $1 trillion a year with the United States of America, only $1 trillion. You are already more, in, obviously not culturally, but in terms of just where your you know, trade prospects are, uh, you know, you're already building a Eurasian system already in terms of, and then there's, that's before you have all these linkages of Belt and Road infrastructure and high speed rails and so forth. And then in terms of trade negotiations, the EU-Japan free trade agreement has just kicked in. There'll be similar ones with ASEAN and with India. China is promising to open up gradually and it's making far more promises to open up to Europe than it is to America because it probably wants to punish America and it's going to punish America. It's going to buy a lot more Airbus planes in the coming years than it is Boeing planes, right? Uh, all of these things are going to happen. So Europe has is, is got the right Asia strategy. The European Union launched a couple of months ago what they call the Asia Connectivity Initiative, which is yet more subsidies, export promotion, uh, you know, risk guarantees and so forth for European companies to go out there and to start to capture some of those deals because Asia is where trillions of dollars a year are being spent uh, in infrastructure of finance. And again, the UK-China Infrastructure Alliance fits into that broader paradigm. So I think, I think Europe is actually doing a pretty good job uh, of this. It's not doing it, again, in a common way other than a couple of things like the Asia Connectivity Initiative. Most stuff is bilateral. It's Germany saying, to hell with you slow growth Eurozone neighbors, we're gonna start selling stuff in, in Asia, right? Sometimes it's um, European countries saying, you know what, we're sick of America's Iran policy. Let's try, as they're fumbling towards now, uh, create a special purpose vehicle to finance trade with Iran outside of America's, you know, prying, meddling, weaponization of finance and sanctions. Things like this, it's Europeans saying, you know what, Russia's paid its, you know, done its penance, uh, you're stuck with Putin forever, but there's oil and gas there that we need and there's, you know, we're being cut out of these markets, you know, to hell with you, Trump and, and American Congress, let's go into Russia. These are some pretty important countries where clearly, you know, Europe diverges uh, from, 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 from the US. Meanwhile, the US failed to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, has launched this trade war with China, and, and so forth, and is certainly not being particularly friendly towards Europe either. So there is very little common Western policy on Asia. At this point, the trains left the station. Go and win whatever game you can, and worry very little about these so-called common values. Where those common values are necessary, uh, they will express themselves. So again, Europe and America see 100% eye to eye that China cheats, China steals intellectual property, China has forced technology transfer, it hurts Americans as much as Europeans. We're joined at the hip there. Let's go out there and hammer China on the head about this. But you're going about it in, in different ways, obviously. But I see plenty of ways in which the West can remain, um, you know, um, you know uh, uh, ethically, morally, principally, militarily, strategically allied without pretending that you should shoot yourselves in the foot economically as a price to pay for that unity. I think you, we go back to the beginning where you uh, talked about China having uh, 1.5 billion, no, 5 mm -hmm, billion, mm -hmm. was it, in, in population, that um, banging China, banging China, that's the way the West thinks. But let's not develop that. Let's come to a question here with Humphrey. If Asia was involved in rewriting a world order, and if there was, say, a new UN charter, the present one says uh, that it affirms the individual human rights, how would we define the new world order a human right? Mm -hmm. It's a great question, but I, I think it's actually a layered, sort of textured question. The first is just about order. You know, and the definition of order is 
lies much more in the distribution of power than the values that govern it, right? So th those are right there separate things. Right now there is a distribution of power where Asia has risen, Europe is still immensely central, and so is the United States. So if you look at any economic map of the world, it's tripolar, you know, uh, and, and the rest of the world barely matters, quite frankly, right? So it's a American, European, Asian world. Within Asia, you also have multiple poles, but you don't have a common perspective. So now you have a world in which, you know, it, again, even within the West, there's disagreements about values. Certainly in Asia, there's disagreements about values. Let me remind everyone, again, there are more people living in democracies in Asia, democracies, democracies in Asia, than the rest of the planet Earth. Now, when we look at Asia, what do we see? Monolithic, authoritarian Chinese face, right? But again, 5 billion people, only 1.5 billion Chinese who live in China and live under authoritarian Chinese governments. In the next four months, India, Indonesia, the Philippines are having democratic elections. We know those are democratic countries. They're democratic enough, that's for sure. That's 1.8 billion people right there. Just three countries, leaving aside all the other democracies in Asia too. So there's no common point of view. Now on how would they define the order, right? What would be sort of the, the rules? Well, again, because Asia has the majority of the world population, whatever rules Asia has to govern itself are de facto a very large part of what is global order. Asia doesn't need to prove its relevance to South America, you know, to be, a, to be global. In any case, every South American country trades more with China than with America. But let me remind you again also of something else, that the Pacific Ocean is planet Earth's largest barrier to human contact. And despite that, <laughs> every South American country trades more with China than with America. And the fastest growing country of trade with, for, for many South American countries, many of them, is India, which is even further away, right? So there, Asia already has a tremendous amount of influence and the rules have actually been written around trade governance, investment governance, mutual respect for sovereignty, non-interference in each other's affairs. Again, many of these countries have joined Belt and Road. Chile, which is hardly contiguous to Asia, has joined the AIIB, right? Um, you know, Iceland has joined the AIIB. Um, Maurizio Macri, the president of Argentina, has just been on a state visit to India last week. There's loads of diplomacy going on amongst Asians and the, the, the countries. Again, Afro-Eurasia, as I said earlier, whenever China convenes a Sino-African summit, every head of state shows up. That's 54 countries right there. So it's a bottom-up thing, not a top-down thing. Asians aren't writing the rules from the top down after a war where all the rules were ripped up. They don't have to. They're borrowing from the existing rules to apply it to themselves and modifying them as suits their purposes for their relations. And this is why I, I strongly argue, and I think this is a hopeful argument, that history doesn't always operate in these you know, cycles of disruption, blank slate war, blank slate start over. It evolves. And Asia is the beneficiary of centuries of European tutelage, learning, institution building, right, knowledge transfer, and so forth. And a century of American security guarantees in the umbrella. Europe is, Europe is what has happened as a result of an American security guarantee. Could you imagine the European Union forming without um, the Marshall Plan and, and the American uh, security alliances like NATO? Of course not, right? NATO helped create, NATO midwife the European Union. In Asia, the American security alliances with Japan, South Korea, and so forth, helped to create, provided the stability that allowed Japan, the tiger economies, and eventually China to grow. So think of these things as evolutionary, right? The West allowed Asia to become what it is, and Asia has learned a lot from it. So it's not either or. There's so much in those last 250 years of Asian experience with the West that Asia has learned from and, and doesn't want to throw away and replace it with authoritarian, monolithic, Chinese, you know, sort of uh, demagoguery. That, that's not what Asia is. And it's not what it's going to be. So I don't, I don't, I, I think that there, and, and uh, you know, it's all just about modifying a little bit, modifying your Western lessons to suit Asian realities. So uh, a future, you know, global charter of human rights it's not necessarily going to look like some kind of, uh, you know, top-down Confucianist, everyone must obey, um, you know, the philosopher king or party kind of doctrine. Because again, most Asians live in democracies, right? So let's 
relax a little bit about it. It's, it's a conversation, it's a dialogue. Of course, you know, in, in large sections towards the end of the book, I talk about these things and I say, look, there is maybe a new set of Asian values, maybe collective responsibility uh, and, 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 you know, sort of deference towards a, a sort of a, a, a sort of social stability matter more to Asians than on a, on a spectrum than it does to us where we privilege and, and, and prize free speech and individual liberty over all else because we already have a certain sense of national social stability and, and a bit more homogeneity actually, whereas in Asia you have so many multi-racial, multi-ethnic, uh, multi-religious countries that if you just shout fire in a crowded theater, uh, physical or digital, that, that's bad news. And you can sympathize, I hope, with why Asian governments, you know, sort of are a bit cautious about the sort of extreme forms of, of, of liberalism. And again, uh, I come from democratic countries, right? I'm an Indian, grew up in the United States largely. I'm not, I'm not hardly an apologist for Chinese authoritarianism. But I, I live in these countries and I put myself in their shoes and surely you can sympathize with some of these narrow incremental modifications on what we would uh, otherwise impose on them. Uh, you know, the less ignorant we are about them, the more we can say. Now, should we tolerate them using that as an excuse for um, unnecessary uh, censorship? No, I don't agree with that at all, right? You know, there's far more censorship uh, of the media uh, than, there, than there should be in, uh, in Asian countries. And very often it's just a self-serving excuse, right, to maintain... Um, you know, sort of a, a, a government privilege and impunity. I obviously disagree with that, and we should be calling that bluff uh, as often as possible, and then that might help with, with reforms. But Asians don't even have the confidence in any, way, in, in any case to, to rewrite some kind of global code, and they wouldn't do it from the top down. It's really a bottom-up process. You mentioned war, which I want to come back to, Parag, but, but following on Humphrey's question, you say in the book, Asians are now seeing themselves as the center of the world. That Western journalists, officials, businessmen, scholars, students touring Asia to observe how to build world-class infrastructures, futuristic cities, and examine social policies that promote national solidarity. They are now aspiring to be like us. We now, they were, we now aspire to be like them. You talk about academia, artificial intelligence, sports, you mentioned basketball. But what about crime? Where do you see crime going as Asia goes into this new world? You can't generalize about it. I have maybe just a couple of paragraphs on this, yeah, on this very important very small, uh, yeah. topic. Because I could be the reason is some of these areas that I condense, um, I condense into a sort of recitation of what the statistics are, simply to point out how divergent it is. It's like saying women's rights. Okay, well, there are countries in Asia that have had multiple female prime ministers, women sit on corporate boards, you know, and, and, uh, and have very high standing in society. And then there's the exact opposite, right? I did not just describe Yemen or Syria, as you can well imagine. I was talking about, you know, yeah. Japan, Korea, and so forth. And of course, you know, New Zealand and so forth. Again, geographically Asian and, and it's inspirational to many Asians, right? When in Asians, even yellow or brown Asians, for lack of a better, to just use colloquial terminology, when they wake up in the morning, they actually do read about the things that Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Taiwan, and Korea, again, democracies, first-rate, world-class, gold-standard democracies are doing, and that actually has an impact on them. So in that sense, you know, you don't think of New Zealand, you don't think of Kiwis as Asians, but if you read the Asian press, they're, they're, they're quite impressed. Wow, there's a, you know, under 40-something female um, prime minister of New Zealand. She gets a lot of play in Asia, right? So Asians can, can learn from their geographic neighbors, even if they're not culturally uh, sort, of, sort of familiar, but they become more so every day. So crime is also one of these things. It's like, okay, you've got high crime countries, but I, I live in a country where no one locks their door right? Uh, Singapore, there, there is no crime. I mean, there, there's like meaningless, you know, sort of crime. So what does that mean? And so, but I want to, I want to use this though as an excuse to talk about um, uh, governance more broadly and again, perceptions of us and them in politics because I want to use the case of the Philippines. The Philippines has a president, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, who we, you know, universally revile. We think of as, of, as an absolute illiberal thug, a guy who's bragged about pushing people out of helicopters, whose drug war has cost, you know, whatever, thousands of lives, um, you know, who's unleashed paramilitary forces to more or less shoot, shoot, uh, shoot to kill, um, but is wildly popular. 
He might well be right now, as we sit here, he's more popular than Theresa May or Donald Trump. Uh, you know, he has something like, you know, I don't know, 75% approval rating, uh, and so does Prime Minister Modi. So why has he got, well, Modi's got elections and other problems yeah. as well. But uh, why, so does why, Duterte. Why I mentioned these countries popularity. going to elections this year. You know, that's among them. And by the way, they might both lose their jobs in the next four months. They're popular now, but Asians are very, very fickle. Again, we think of them as being... Uh, you know, lemming-like, obedient people living in fear of their masters. There, there's 30, 40 years of history of Asians tossing out their leaders, from Suharto to Marcos and, and, and uh, changes of government, uh, all across the region. Only in China and North Korea and, like, you know, Vietnam and a couple of places are people genuinely in fear uh, of their government, right? Uh, and in a broad sense. Again, I, I pity um, the, the independent, you know, the, the journalists, right, who are being targeted in these, in these extrajudicial sort of killings. Modi is guilty of it. Duterte is, is intimidating. Uh, the great um, uh, Maria Ressa, right, who many of you probably know right now, who's, who's a friend of mine and a very outspoken uh, uh, a Filipino journalist. So there are those, there, the, again, I say speak out about those issues. But crime, we, again, it's uh, another example of a very simple matter of putting yourself in their shoes. If you were a lower middle class, a working class, or poor Filipino, which is most Filipinos, and you've had a relative gunned down by a drug lord or have relatives who are addicted to drugs, and you know that it was just pushed on them by um, you know, a teenage drug, um, drug dealer, you'd say someone's got to clean this up. And all of the urbane and liberal and, and you know, sort of uh, uh, Western-leaning and well-dressed leaders that we've had who were effectively kleptocrats over the last decades have done no such thing about it. In fact, they've let it get worse. And now we've got the Chinese mafia and triads in there making it worse. You would love Duterte. Go to the Philippines. You're not going to find a single, and you know, I live in Singapore, so you know, we, we, you meet a lot of Filipinos, right? They're the ones who, who do a lot of the, the services sector work, let's say. Um, and uh, talk to any one of them. Um, they all love Duterte. They love him. They don't worship him. They, they know his flaws. They're not idiots, right? They know that he's not a nice guy. Right? But they're, and, they're, and, and they don't think they're making a devil's bargain because they, believe, they actually believe in their democracy. So on the one hand, got to clean up this war on drugs. On the other hand, if he gets too illiberal, we'll throw him out. That same thing is happening to Modi right now. Modi was elected in this wave of popularity, swept into power. I and everyone else thought, oh, the, finally, someone's going to have 10 straight years to fix India, and he's got a good technocratic program, infrastructure investment, and so forth. Sitting here right now, we don't know if the guy's going to have a job in four months, right? So the people are not as, uh, you know, sort of obedient uh, to, to authority as we think they are. And that's a great thing. You know, it means they're getting smarter, they're paying attention. There's rapid feedback loops in, in, in politics. But there's no question as to why he's popular. There, it, it should be so obvious to everyone. So crime, yeah, where it's bad, people are going uh, to uh, accept leaders who are going to do something about it. They're very impatient. Impatience is the greatest virtue in a democracy, <laughs> quite frankly. It's the great, great virtue in any society. Never accept second best. Oh, totally. Agree. Which, which you totally. obviously are right now. Uh, I, I don't think we set out to yeah. do that. Uh, uh, we obviously are now. That's an interesting statement for another day. But, um, well, I'll say this about Singapore, right? Because, you know, I, I live there and it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, our understanding of what a completely open, multi party, you know, free and fair sort of liberal democracy uh, is. I mean, they have free and fair elections, but they, they, they circumvent which parties can run based on a variety of ethnic and other kinds of uh, criteria uh, in the name of social stability, but it certainly helps to enforce, reinforce the status of the incumbent party. But you have a very educated population, right? They're the, probably the most educated people in the world, all five million of them. Um, and uh, and, and they, they are the most impatient, demanding, complaining uh, people in the world, right? And they, they, will, they will absolutely not hesitate to stick it to their government, you know, vocally, um, you know, even absent of fully free uh, press. They're very critical complainers. And the government, therefore, is, in, is actually in fear of them. You're not going to hear them say that. They're not going to talk like that because it's a, a civilized place. But whatever the people want, the people pretty much get. You know, and I can cite you 10 examples of a areas where the, the ruling party that faces no electoral challenge, no, no significant electoral challenge, 
could easily do what it wants, right? It could say, oh, let's let all the high net worth property investors come in and, you know, jack up the values and we're all landowners, we're going to make a killing off of this. And the people say, uh-uh, we don't like the volatility in the housing market, no more foreigners buying real estate. Boom, they stop. Immigration, too many foreigners clogging our uh, pristine subways, get them out. Immigration, frozen. Right? So there's a, there's a government that's not our version of democracy that does everything that people want because they're absolutely afraid of this intelligent citizenry actually one day saying, you know what, you're really not listening to us and we're going to screw you. And so that's why whether you're a functioning democracy or a rigged government or even an authoritarian country that doesn't have full and total control, you know, your, your greatest enemy is an educated public that is, that is uh, you know, sort of demanding. And so you should be hyper demanding. So does that suggest other countries don't have an educated public? That's a, an argument to go down another time. Yeah. We, we haven't got time. Again, you're uh, still better off than but, America on but that I, score. You <laughs> mentioned <laughs> the 5 million population of Singapore, half the size of London roughly. Yeah. Um, we are heading in at an alarming rate to absolutely unthinkable knife crime, and not just in London. Yeah. What would happen in Singapore then if the population here don't want knife crime? Well, how would it be dealt with? Well, the, the thing is, there's this, you know, in economics, we use this term initial conditions, right? I mean, it was um, the, uh, the initial conditions in Singapore weren't actually particularly propitious, actually, because you had race riots and you had the ejection from Malaysia and you, you had a, a, a lot of racial, you, know, you just had a lot of tensions across the board. You had a communist, you know, threat, fears of communist insurgency and, and so forth. So things were not all hunky-dory in the 1950s. Uh, in early 60s in, in Singapore. But, you know, Lee Kuan Yew obviously made some tough calls, you know. Um, let me combine two things in answering this, and, and let me jump to the second one first, because it gets to your point about, um, you know, you had that quote, what can we learn from them? And, you know, we go and we study over there. And that's actually true, because Singapore is one example, and in one particular policy, where they have this public housing scheme, right, where everyone is, is granted uh, ownership of a, of a housing unit. It's a publicly built and financed, but privately owned and subsidized. So you have 100% home ownership. Now, everyone on earth at this point is studying that model, you know, and, and uh, in Financial Times, New York Times, every Nobel Prize winning economist has gone to Singapore and said, you know what? Every country in the world should do something like this. And that's one example from one country, but there's others. Uh, Korea, South Korea with digitization, 5G, you know, and now there are citizen engagement apps, right? Every country should be doing it. So there are a few examples out there of things that Asians are doing that we'd be well served to learn from. But you didn't have guns, right? You didn't have, every, every person wasn't armed to the teeth in Singapore. Uh, other than knives, um, you know, in the, um, uh, in, in the 1950s and 60s. So it was easy to say, well, guess what? No private gun ownership because people didn't have guns, right? So, so you're not going to be able to reverse, uh, you know, especially with knives, certainly. I mean, the guns, you could do more with gun control here. It's not a, as huge a problem as it is in America, obviously. But with knives and so forth, you know, you can't, can't take away everyone's knives. You're going to have to, uh, you know, undertake other kinds of social... Uh, interventions and, and, you know, kind of um, uh, alternative livelihood kinds of things to get people off the streets and break up gangs and, and so forth. And by the way, countries with guns can be safe. I wrote part, part of, I uh, used this as a case study in my, my previous book uh, about called Technocracy in America. I looked at Switzerland, obvious example. Everyone in Switzerland has a gun, but they don't really have gun crime, right? Uh, so you can socially engineer, you know, sort of responsible behavior into a country that has gun ownership. If I can move on to war, I mean, I'd like to talk more about um, poverty and 5 million people in Singapore and 300 million poor in India, right. um, but we haven't got time. Um, in the book, you say war has a role to play in developing the future. You list some geographical flashpoints, but you didn't mention India-Pakistan. No, of course I did. Um, How could I not? Well, well not, not in, in the way that I'm about to go on to. Um, the Observer last weekend had the headline that says... The standoff in the Himalayas is our last hope that a war will sort this once and for all. <laughs> As tensions continue in the region, some say a decisive India-Pakistan conflict will be much better than a fragile status quo. 
if it were decisive, but there's no prop guarantee that it would be decisive. I mean, I, I well, recall, what, what I recall a couple decisive? of countries going to Iraq thinking it was going to be decisive uh, 16 years ago. It didn't prove to be all that decisive, did it? Nor, nor has Afghanistan. So I don't really believe in. Um, but what would make it decisive? Expectations. What would make an India-Pakistan India war decisive? Uh, the outcome being a partition of Kashmir along the line of control, turning the de facto division into a de jure division, and that would more or less put an end to you know the, 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 the most significant area, obviously, of territorial hostility between them. There would be other kinds of animosities and suspicions and, and tensions, but that's obviously the big one. It goes without saying. So you don't need a war to decide that that line of control should become a border. You simply need to um, have a blind process by which uh, the decision over doing so is outsourced to an anonymous international committee, binational committee, and the decision held over to a subsequent administration from the previous one. So a very step-by-step -step technocratic process where the incumbent government wouldn't lose an election because it was seen to have been the one to make a compromise and cede sovereignty to the other. So I can sketch out for you on a napkin exactly how you could avoid war to get to this outcome, but you'd actually just have to do it. And part of the reason we don't do things is because we haven't done them, because inertia is really one of yeah. the most powerful forces in the world. It's not because we can't do them, because you know we, I've been in plenty of rooms in Washington where retired Indian and Pakistani generals came in and said, oh, if we just had five more years, we would have crafted a peace agreement and, and, and so forth. So, you know, I think on both sides, they know what a settlement would look like. Uh, you could draw it on a napkin in the same way that you could divide countries on a napkin, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, by the way, here's the thing. I mean, as last week also demonstrates, they know when to stop, right? Uh, even when they actually use their air, air forces and bomb cross-border targets, not just in Kashmir, but in the others, legitimate sovereign territory, they also know where to stop. And uh, so do I worry about war in Asia? Of course I do. I, you know, I write about it all the time. There are nine major conflict scenarios in Asia, India, Pakistan, North Korea, China, Japan, India, China, you know, Taiwan, South China Sea, the list goes on and on and on. But in the last 30 years, Asians have done a pretty good job at economically converging and finding their complementarities while keeping these major historical tensions at bay, and I expect them to continue to do that. But if there is war, it doesn't invalidate the notion that they are increasing the systemness. War is part of what makes the system. Europe has been a system for centuries because of all these, all of these wars that Europe has had internally are proof that Europe is a system. It means you have a lot more to do with each other than with others, and your ambitions, your frictions, um, have, or, or relate directly to your neighbors. Um, so the fact that Asia, that Asian conflicts are sharpening is proof that it's becoming a system. Systems, uh, system or non-system has nothing to do with peace whatsoever. War is, war is part of the definition of a system. And, and then when you settle those wars, fairly or unfairly, peacefully or violently, you still move towards more systemness. So North Korea, there may be war, there may not be war. Looks like there won't be. So North Korea becomes yet another more integrated member of the system. India, Pakistan, you'll have war, you won't have war. One day, there'll be a settlement. And once you have settlement, you move on and you deepen the system. And that's how Europe evolved towards being a peaceful system. By being a warlike system for centuries, it eventually became a peaceful one. So I'm content with the idea, as disappointing as it would be, that there will be wars in Asia. None of it invalidates a syllable of what's in this book, because I'm all about war and geopolitics. It's all I've studied for, for decades. <laughs> I know wars will happen but they will contribute to the building of the system. Did you expect Trump to come away from North Korea with something? Or no, I did not at all. They had, they had not defined denuclearization. It's the most ridiculous premise on which to build optimism when you haven't even <laughs> agreed on the terms before going in. Uh, I mean, diplomacy uh, takes, takes a long, long time uh, when, you, when you can't even agree on the terms. Uh, so, no, I think it was very silly. It was, it was silly of him to even go there. Do you think he staged the walkout? Uh, He's a salesman, and the greatest, two greatest sales weapons were silence and denial. I mean, apparently so he, he was, you know, that. watching this uh, Michael Cohen testimony sort of in real time or whatever, or was, you know, quite, quite upset, and, and uh, maybe he was advised to say, let's pick up and leave. Because remember, he's got John Bolton, you know, whispering in his ear, who's also obviously quite a, quite a hawk. 
um, and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, I'm not, not really sure. It, it, again, these things just don't matter. We read so much into diplomatic symbolism. Too much, do you think? Way too much. Right. Again, the meeting never should have happened. So the worst thing that could happen, whether he walks out in a huff or whether they enjoy a fabulous meal together, um, is that you still wind up with the status quo ante because nothing actually got done and nothing was going to get done. So in, in the grand scheme of things, are we going to look back and say, oh, but he walked out? No, we actually should be focusing, focused on whether or not there is going to be a common definition of denuclearization. That's the only thing that matters here, not was the wine red or white. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? So, yeah. So I, I wanted to ask a question about China-India rivalry. I think you just yeah. mentioned that. And you also know that uh, China, uh, India is against CPEC, the biggest uh, project yeah. of BRI. So how would that impact the future of CPEC? Sure, a great question. And the yeah. uh, second question is about, uh, you said that Asians are impatient. So what about the internal dynamics of China? the political changes, uh, one party system in its right. future, right. and its impact on the future sure. of Asia. Great question. So let me take the second one first. Look, I mean, again, why do, to the extent that we can, you know, to the extent that we can genuinely, meaningfully gauge or measure these things, Chinese are, are happy enough with their system. That goes without saying. You have tens of thousands in protests in China all the time. But they're not protests against this, the, the uh, Central Standing Committee in Beijing. They're protests against um, local Communist Party officials or companies or whomever has engaged in corrupt behavior or malfeasance. And therefore, uh, they use those protests and even social media to identify those people. And then the, the, the Beijing actually will sack those people and imprison them. It's part of the, not all of the tens of thousands of people that have been thrown into jail in China in the anti-corruption drive have been enemies of Xi Jinping. I don't know, maybe it's a few hundred, but, but thousands have been actually you know, guilty of low-level petty corruption, and that satisfies the people uh, in some ways. So the material progress alone in China is sufficient to make the case that China is not going to experience any change in the type of regime. It will, this regime will stay and persist but it will evolve and adapt. And it has evolved and adapted in many, many ways over the last 20, 30 years through technology, institutional mechanisms, how the party interacts with the state and, and with, each, with itself and so forth. And this is now an enormous literature and area of study. If you actually think that this communist party, this, this group of people or the way they run the country, just because it's seven men who you can't tell apart from each other, don't worry, neither can I, um, you know, if you just think it's seven guys and they just sit there like, you know, uh, Soviet apparatchiks making decisions and that's the way it was under Mao, you just don't know anything about China, right? It, it, it is by, by any measure a highly adaptive regime procedurally. We have changed way less than China has, like way less. We don't change at all compared to America does, literally does not change. There hasn't been a constitutional amendment in China since, in America since the early 1970s. So quite frankly, as much as I would like to see a different government in China, we're not going to see a different government in China. It's much more interesting to ask, how will the current government in China adapt and modify in ways that are novel, interesting, hopefully progressive, in some ways obviously not progressive, uh, but it is adaptive. Um, so therefore, it's not going to change the overall picture. You know, China's interests are its interests. It's clear what they are. You know, it pursues them. It succeeds in some cases, not in others. Pakistan is a good example. Um, so CPEC, uh, as you mentioned, is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor which is one of the pillars of the Belt and Road Initiative, but as you well know, it long predates Belt and Road. Pakistan has been a client state of China since the late 1950s, basically. You know, the Karakoram Highway Network began to develop in the 60s. Um, the, it is the largest recipient now, obviously, of Chinese uh, lending and infrastructure projects, but you can clearly see, again, it's not a colony of, um, uh, of China. Actually, the joke in Pakistan is that CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, stands for the colonization of Pakistan for the enrichment of China. And, and, and the fact that they can joke about it shows that there is this, they're on hyper alert about this exploitation. And so what are they, they're actually doing something about it. 
They've reduced the, the, the sort of uh, declared value of projects from $60 billion down to 30 or less. They are demanding more competition in the marketplace. They're demanding that more Pakistani jobs be created than Chinese jobs. And all of these things. When word got out that one of the Chinese provinces that has a lot of um, um, stone masonry factories wanted to extract marble from quarries in Pakistan and bring it back to China in order to make these refined marble products and sell them back to Pakistan, they went ballistic. In Pakistan. They said, no way, we've heard of this before. We, we now know what mercantilism is. We've been through that before. No way. And there was this like huge retraction from China, like, oh, no one said that, no one said that, right? Again, this is this examples of China being on like on the most powerful country in Asia by this much is acting defensively and scurrying back like a mouse because they're so afraid of the backlash, right? So they now have to give out lots of gifts, you know, uh, to all of these countries if they want to keep them on their, on their good side, and Pakistan is one of them. So, but the China-Pakistan relationship remains very, very strong, obviously. You know, when Imran Khan was uh, elected, you should have heard his first press conference. It was 30 minutes, 20 minutes of which were basically about not how great China is and how we are Chinese vassal, no, but what can Pakistan learn from China? modernization, development, infrastructure, investment, emphasis on education, uh, anti-corruption, right? All these things, the, the good things that China has done and that, that more or less by now, even those who hate China admire China for having done, right? It's like we should learn these things. Uh, so there is, there is actually some intellectual balance there that we don't tend to ascribe uh, uh, to these countries. But the China-Pakistan relationship is strong and, the, um, and India is you know, on the back foot, obviously, because these, some of this stuff traverses Kashmir. Um, and therefore, India has opposed the Belt and Road Summit. But again, India is the second largest shareholder in the Chinese Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. So there is cooperation and, and, and competition at the same time, and that's where it stands. There's no, there's no right answer. There's no end state. It's very fluid, and it's going to continue to be, and it's going to draw in Afghanistan. It's going to draw in Iran. It's going to draw in Saudi Arabia. Uh, in fact, just last week when Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman was in Pakistan and then India and China, he has had to walk a fine line between, you know, sort of saying, well, I'm friends with everyone. So what's going on is sort of, you know, this broader phenomenon of what, of what is called frenemies, right? Frenemies, they're friends and enemies. And that's the way Asians have, have actually always been with each other, they're frenemies. Can, can I stop you at that point, Ari, because we've got four more questions, only 10 minutes, we're not okay. gonna get them all in. So I was wondering, while initially when Belt and Road started, Chinese investments were mainly driven by political interests. So like we see Port of Hambantota in Sri Lanka, as well as other strategic choices. Uh, so they weren't as financially reasonable. Uh, however, okay, more, yeah, more recently in? Yeah. they have uh, announced that they are trying to be more reasonable with regards and more selective with regards to these projects. So why do you think this happened? So it, it's not true that Belt and Road started out focusing on you know, political, and, and by the way, just as an aside, there really is no clear separation between political and economic, and you know, return on investment being purely financial consideration with no politics. Don't kid yourself, right? The history of the World Bank is not the history of a purely neutral, independent and impartial organization doling out loans on a purely merit-based set of procedures, right? The United States would not be so interested in who the president of the World Bank is if that's how it actually worked. Everything is political always. There is no distinction. There never has been, there never will be. Do not ever kid yourself about this. We are not angels. The Chinese are no better and no worse. They learned it from us to a large degree, right? So I want to be absolutely clear as someone who's been involved in numerous diplomatic institutions and in the military and in US government and, and, and so forth. So what has, what has led to the scaling back revision? It's uh, Chinese state-owned companies saying, you know what, we actually do want to make some money off of these things, so just lending out money indiscriminately to countries that are never going to pay it back is not really good for us, especially since credit is getting tightened back in China on us. Why should we go out and lose money on the one hand and then have our credit tightened on the other hand? That's not good for us as companies. And the further Chinese companies go from the mainland, the more they think like a typical multinational profit-driven company. And there, there's plenty of research on this, and that's a good thing, actually, which is part, part of why you might even want to encourage the globalization of Chinese companies, because that's where they actually learn how to act not like state enterprises, right? Because then they have to compete in a proper marketplace where they don't get to set the rules. And in some ways, they re-import those rules back 
because Huawei and other countries, or Alibaba is a good example. You know, Alibaba is effectively a private company, though there's manipulation of its board and so forth now uh, by, by the government. But China, when, when Alibaba goes abroad, because it's a big global company now, um, if it says, no, everyone has to use China Union Pay to use the Alibaba platform, right? And so now everyone's gonna have to use a Chinese Union Pay credit card because, you know, back in Beijing they say so because they want to promote Union Pay. That's what a state-owned, you know, politically motivated enterprise would have to do. That would be disastrous for Alibaba. Think about all those people who use Visa and MasterCard. They don't get to use Alibaba. That sucks for Alibaba. So Alibaba is telling Beijing, Alibaba is not forcing its customers all over the world to use Union Pay. Alibaba is telling Beijing, you better not impose any of these conditions because we want to be a big you know, global company and the only way to really succeed is to, is to be open and have open standards and interoperability and so forth. And that's again a good thing. So I'm giving you a really seminal example because Alibaba is not a small company, right? Chinese telecoms are going to learn this. Huawei is going to learn this. Everyone's going to learn this. And again, it's a, it's a law of history. Uh, globalization, integration, having to compete in a, in a marketplace is, is how we learn, right? Countries don't end corruption because you dropped a 500-page World Bank report on the minister's desk, right? The, the corruption goes down because you made them join, because they joined the World Trade Organization and they signed investment uh, treaties, right? Where you get sued if you're corrupt. That's how you change behavior, but that's a form of globalization. So I'm giving a long answer already, but, um, but anyway, some, some countries will get less investment, some countries will get more. It's political, but it's also, again, about the supply chains more than it is about politics, because China doesn't actually care as much about these countries as we think they do. It doesn't want these colonies. It would be gladly abandon them all. It doesn't want to own Angola. It doesn't want to run Angola. By the way, as soon as China starts importing less, less oil from Angola, it pulls people out of Angola, and that's exactly what it's done. Quick question, please. Will populism dynamite the future of Asia as this is dynamiting America at the moment? This is dynamiting Britain. From what you've said, it's dynamiting the solution to the Pakistan-India problem. Populism, simple question to answer. I mean, again, Asians remain, by and large, very pragmatic, right? It's sort of they don't want their progress of the recent decades to be derailed by either domestic, you know, sort of populism of our anti-globalist variety or in the international let's, let's just fight a war for fun kind of a variety. So, you know, ethno-populist nationalism has its place. Again, guys like Duterte, guys like Modi whip up, you know, uh, ethnic or religious sentiment. Um, but the societies, by and large, remain on this pragmatic path. And I'll give you the, the sort of, you know, back and forward tested almost uh, evidence. You can't forward test, but, but my projection is that whoever wins these next elections in India, Indonesia, and the Philippines, they're going to follow the exact same policies. Whoever comes after Duterte, he'll be tough on crime too. He could wear a suit from Savile Row. He's still going to be tough on crime because the people want it. He's going to invest in education, in healthcare, in infrastructure, in jobs. He's going to raise wages. Whoever he or she is, they're going to do the same thing because these are pragmatic policies that poor countries need. And again, like I said, they're not afraid to throw out leaders who don't do the simple, basic, necessary things. And Asia is still in that phase where a five-year-old could figure out how to, what the platforms of policy should be um, rather than argue about them because there's uneducated people. There's sewer, open sewers, right, uh, and so on and so forth. So I think it's, it's fairly straightforward, and thus I don't see populism being a big risk. Uh, you know, and again, I point out in the book, we talk about, you, you pick up the cover of The Economist or you know, our newspapers and magazines, it's all about hyper, you know, uh, populism is sweeping the world, borders are going up everywhere, you know, xenophobia and protectionism are the norm. Not true. Five billion people in the world are bringing down borders, having visa-free regimes, opening up to migration, joining trade agreements, and on and on. They're doing the exact opposite of our populism. So our Eurocentric parochialism is, is, is empirically unacceptable. I mean, it's ridiculous. We should laugh at ourselves for being so narrow in our narrow-mindedness. And we should be, when we were to look at the world from outside and say, hmm, let's highlight the countries that are kind of succumbed to this sort of self-defeating uh, and counterproductive populism, we should be so embarrassed to be in that club in America and Britain. So embarrassing, right? Because the rest of the world is not doing that. The rest of the world is not nearly as stupid as we are, to be really, really, really blunt about it. And that's why I'm an expat. That's why I travel abroad. Because I know the UK. I did my PhD here. I've lived here. I love it. 
I'm American, but guess what? We aren't the world, right? You know, 90% of the world population is doing the exact opposite of what we're doing, thank God, is all I can say. This gentleman here with the glasses. Hello, it's Tom here. Thank you for sharing your insights. Um, I know on your bio it says that in addition to being an author, you also run a strategic advisory business, and it was based on data and scenarios. And I just wondered, what's the most unusual scenario that you've been asked to advise on? In terms of... Um, Crazy scenarios uh, that I've sort of um, encountered. Uh, you know, in, in the real world, um, you know, countries and, 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 and whether it's governments or, or companies don't pay for crazy. You know, they pay for what can we learn for, for, uh, from what actually uh, works. So I, I don't, it's sort of outside the scope of what I do to these, do kind of crazy wild card uh, kinds of scenarios. But uh, what I do notice though through my work is that countries, again, that we don't really appreciate as being pragmatic and, and, and sort of reform oriented, you know, we think they're backwards, dumb, whatever, uh, are actually really, really looking to do pragmatic things to, to fix their, their situations. And, and those are the only kinds of countries uh, that I ever want to work with. Parag, thank you. You, you say in the book, to, to bring this to a conclusion, that until 1880, China, India, and Japan had a GDP greater than the US, UK, France, Germany, and Italy. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. You were on German television towards the end of 2017, and you said, history has not ended, but returned. So we are back to 1880, and the future is clearly Asian. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Parag Khanna. Thank you.